Welcome back to Beit Yahuwah. We are just looking at the wonderful influence of Christianity on the uh, history of science and how some, so many great scientists like Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal, and Lute, uh, others were Christians, praise God forevermore. Now we're coming to uh, Nicky Gumbel's conclusion in this chapter. We haven't read the whole chapter, we've jumped over the page. Science and scripture complement each other. God has revealed himself both in creation and supremely in Jesus Christ. As witnessed to in the scriptures, science is the study of God's general revelation in creation. Biblical theology is the study of God's special revelation in Jesus and the scriptures. The psalmist speaks of this general revelation in the natural world. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The Apostle Paul makes a similar claim. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Notice that, clearly seen. This is me speaking now, not Mickey Gumbel. Clearly seen, seen, seen. What is the first principle of science? Observation! Amen! You observe, then you hypothesize, then you observe through experimentation, and then you see whether or not your hypothesis is confirmed. Amen! Paul says it's been clearly seen. In other words, he's talking about that aspect of observation. Some have argued, as William Paley did in the 18th century, that the existence of God could be proved from natural theology, i.e., God's general revelation in creation. Perhaps that is going too far. What can be said is that God the Creator has made a world in which there is much to suggest the presence of more than meets the eye and he has not left it wholly without marks of his character i just remembered what i was forgot on the last video gerald schroeder a jewish scientist has demonstrated a connection in his understanding between the timings of genesis and the timings of what he modern science has come up with in terms of the creation whether or not you agree with him i don't know but he's a scientist and he believes in the god of the bible at least i believe he believes in the god of the Bible, I'm not so sure he fully comprehends the God who he believes in, because he's not a Christian, he does not believe yet in our Lord Yehoshua, the Mashiach. And now we continue with the uh, Nicky Gumbel. There are two main arguments for this. First, there is the argument that since everything has a cause, there must be a first cause. The popular version of this is in the story of the Hyde Park orator, who was attacking belief in God. He argued that the world just happened. As he spoke, a soft tomato was thrown at him. Who threw that? He demanded angrily. A cockney from the back of the crowd replied, No one threw it. It threw itself. This argument is not a proof, but it is a pointer. It is easier to believe that God created something out of nothing than to believe that nothing created something out of nothing. Towards the end of his life, Charles Darwin wrote of the impossibility of conceiving the immense and wonderful universe, including man, as a result of blind chance or necessity. When thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look at, to look to a first cause, having an intelligent mind in some degree analogous to that of man, and I deserve to be called a theist. Oh, Dawkins, 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 you're barking up the wrong tree when you act like you have Dar Darwin on your side. Let me let me read that for, for Dawkins once more and for all you atheists who think that Dawkins is representing Darwin. Here it goes. Once more, just for your sake. If I can find it. Towards the end of his life, Charles Darwin wrote of open speech marks the impossibility the impossibility of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe 
including man, as a result of blind chance or necessity. When thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look to a first cause having an intelligent mind in some degree analogous to that of man. And I degree to record a theist. I am going to make another video just to have that point made by Darwin. The second argument is based on the evidence of design. Again, this does not amount to a proof, but is a powerful indicator. Professor Chandra Vikramasinghe, who comes from a Buddhist background, has said, the chances that life just occurred on Earth are about as unlikely as a typhoon blowing through a junkyard and producing a Boeing 747. <laughs> The matter of design has recently come to the fore with the anthropic principle that physical constraints of nature are so finely tuned that if they were slightly different, we would not exist. Open. Quote. In the early expansion of the universe, there has to be a close balance between the expansive energy drawing them apart and the force of gravity pulling things together. If expansion dominated, the matter would fly apart too rapidly for condensation into galaxies and stars to take place. Nothing interesting could happen in so thinly spread a world. On the other hand, if gravity dominated the world, the world would collapse in on itself before there was time for the processes of life to get going. For us to be possible requires a balance between the effects of expansion and contraction, which at a very early epoch in the universe's history, the Planck time, has to be has to differ from equality by not more than 1 in 10 to the power of 60. That's 1 in 10 with 60 zeros after it. The numerate will marvel at such a degree of accuracy. For the non-numerate, I will borrow an illusion, an illustration from Paul Davis of what that accuracy means. He points out that it is the same as aiming at a target an inch wide on the other side of the observable universe 20,000 million light years away and hitting the mark. <laughs> that was a good illustration for you atheists to take into consideration while you're out there peddling your ignorance. Okay, Stephen Hawkins makes the point that if the destiny of the universe one second after the Big Bang had been greater by one part in a thousand billion, the universe would have re-collapsed after ten years. On the other hand, if the destiny of the universe at that time had been less by the same amount, the universe would have been essentially empty space. It was about ten years old, since it was about ten years old. How was it that the initial density of the universe was chosen so carefully? Maybe there is some reason why the universe should have precisely the critical density. Although he does not believe in a creator God, his own theory would seem to point in that direction. Nor is it just life that has to be explained. It is intelligent life, the human mind, the rational structure of the world, beauty, human love, friendship, and justice. There are, these are all dimensions of reality which point beyond chemical and biological laws. Could all this simply be the result of blind chance and natural selection with no intelligent mind behind the process? The evidence of science may point to the existence of God. General revelation suggests the tremendous power, intelligence, and imagination of a personal creator. But without the special revelation of Jesus Christ as witnessed in the, to, in the scriptures, we would have known little about him. Albert Einstein, writing from a Jewish perspective, said, A legitimate conflict between science and religion cannot exist. Science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. Science without religion is lame for a number of reasons. First, we cannot find the God of the Bible through science alone. Unfortunately for the scientifically minded, God is not discoverable or demonstrable by purely scientific means. But that really proves nothing. It simply means that the wrong instruments are being used for the job. That was Einstein. We need God's special revelation as well as his general revelation. The first six verses of Psalm 19 speak of God's general revelation. So let us hear Isaac Newton. He recognizes that you scientists... You are blind without 